Hello and welcome clinicians, this is Ali Nasser and I wanted to announce a brand new segment that I'm adding to our website called Practice Profiles. In this segment that is geared towards teaching dental students and endo residents about the operations of a real world dental practice, we hope to share the daily operations of an endodontic practice from a practical point of view. Now, if you're an endodontist and you think that your practice and practice philosophy can be of educational value to budding dentists and endodontic residents out there, please drop me a note in the address below and I will fly into your practice, wherever it is, and I do a little short interview uh, on your practice philosophy and your basic operations. Now, we start this series by visiting one of our own faculty, Dr. Bradley Tratner, endodontist extraordinaire and faculty at University of Maryland. For those residents and students out there, don't forget to leave comments below uh, if this segment is really helpful to you. I sure hope that this kind of information helps you envision and shape your own office philosophy for a successful career and a successful practice in the years ahead. Hi, my name is Dr. Bradley Tratner. I'm uh, an endodontist in Baltimore, Maryland. I work at Endodontic Specialist, a uh, group practice with another partner, Dr. Howard Cohn. And I'd like to show you around our office, so follow me. This is our waiting room. Over here is our front desk uh, where the patients will uh, sign in. Now we can go through here and let's show you some of the operatories. Here is our surgical operatory that we will work with. We have a global six-step microscope behind me with video um, capability. Then we have computers, monitors for myself, that back by the little doctor stand. And we have a computer monitor for the patients that uh, enables them to see all the treatment as I'm progressing and it really lets me go over their treatment plan w with them. We have rear delivery systems microscopes in every room and also um, ultrasonics. I do most of my surgeries first thing in the morning. I like to use at least two assistants when I do surgery and I usually do approximately one one surgery a morning. Let's go down the hall. Here's the desk where the patients will leave from and they'll take care of all their financial needs with our office manager. And Over here you'll see we have Another operatory, this is a treatment operatory. We use all rotary systems and computers and microscopes. We have our lab right here, so we have our washing machine, all our files, our autoclave. Here's our, another treatment operatory, and this is uh, one of our favorite operatories at the end, because we get to have a bay window in it, and uh, patients really enjoy the view, especially when it's nice outside. Let's take you to the back, where we can take you to our CBCT that we have it gives us the capability to treatment plan, retreatments, and also surgical cases, and sometimes it uh, avoids the unnecessary exploratory procedure for surgery when we can take a comb beam and decide when not to do a surgery and when a tooth should be extracted. We can go this way, and we have our business office where normally we would have our two business managers that will be sitting back here. And we have a nice little lunch area for our staff. We have my private office back here. And I will normally, after I go over the CBCT, I will bring the patient back and review their findings on, um, at my desk with them. The instrumentation and observation system I use is the Brassler system. It is, um, I have been um, trained in, and teach in the um, endo sequence technique and use hydraulic condensation. You get the best 3D obturation that there is. Um, the bioceramics have really revo uh, revolutionized the, um, the ability for us to uh, fill the canals and seal everything that we need to. Um, instrumentation wise, ESX is, is a wonder and I'm just glad it's here. We're a fee-for-service practice and I enjoy that because it gives me the ability to not see 20 to 30 patients a day. I can spend time with the individual. I get to know the individuals. I get to know their families. So one of the aspects that I really enjoy uh, in, in private practice is the ability to become a businessman along with the ability to be a clinician. A practice that is run with a hands-on approach from staffing, calling patients, um, follow-up with patients. 
referrals. People that want to be successful are going to have to take a, a frontline stance on everything from front desk to uh, of patient management. What I would tell the residents, and I do tell the residents every day, is spend the time to do good work. If you take your time, you do the work the right way, the referrals will come. Never be concerned about how many patients you're seeing. Just try to diagnose and treat everybody fairly as you would like to be treated or try to treat everybody as if it's your mother in the chair. That'll make everybody think twice. What I'd like to do now is just to go over a few cases with you, um, two quick cases, and then after that we'll move into an operatory and I'll show you how we triage and actually work um, with our assistants in our endo sequence. So we have a first case over here. It's a lower bicuspid, as you can see. Uh, one of the cusp tips had broken. Um, tooth is restorable, and we'd like to try to save it. Now, w one thing you really need to do as you evaluate radiographs is you really want to see, if you look at the cuspid, you can see tooth number 22 has a canal. You can visualize all the way down the canal. But tooth number 21, you see the canal sort of a, about five, six millimeters down seems to really almost disappear. And almost, you could say, yeah, maybe it's a little calcified, but canals usually don't calcify from the bottom up. They usually calcify from the top down. So what we're looking at and what we're trying to think is that maybe this canal actually splits into two canals. 1975 Slowey um, had coined the phrase fast break. And, and this is one thing you really have to look and visualize. So you have one canal that really splits into two. And, and as you can see through from the next radiograph, that's exactly what happens. We have one canal splits into two. And then what happens is we can go ahead and fill both canals and, and, the, and, and the general dentist did want a post basin here and we made that in one of the canals. But you have to be very difficult because these are going to be thin canals and most of the time both of the orifices will not be at the original orifice. They will split within usually four to five millimeters below the original orifice. So it takes a little working with your microscope and a little practice um, instrumenting with your little 10 and 15 hand files first until you can get your uh, endo sequence in there. But once you get that in, you get a nice result like this. Here's another case I'd like to go over with you. This is a case that was referred to me for a lesion uh, interproximal between tooth number four and five. As you can see, the lesion we have here is fairly substantial. Seems to be originating from tooth number five, but it is spreading all the way laterally to tooth number four. A very important aspect of a case such as this is to make sure that we pulp test both teeth. So we go ahead and we usually take a few different radiographs. As you can see here, um, the lesion is um, not at the, uh, not completely at the apex and there may be a little lateral canal. And if you look here, it looks like maybe we have a little lateral canal here. So we're going down and as we proceed through, we have two canals in this case, and it's a uh, first bicuspid, and that will normally be the occurrence. So we go ahead and finish this case. We got a nice little sealer puff here. We have two canals filled here, and we are very fortunate to have a one-year follow-up, and we can see we got wonderful healing with this case. Um, and this is not always, uh, this is not always uh, the case that happens where we're going to get such nice fill of bone within one year. Um, with this case, I think because of the endo sequence, the, the ability for us to get our irrigation down along with the instrumentation and the um, flowable material that we're using, such as the bioceramics, able to get into all the different um, accessory canals at the apex, we got wonderful healing. So basically, if we want to figure out how I was able to instrument this case, I would start as I would with most cases, always start with hand files. It's extremely important to start with hand files. You go with a 10 and a 15. At this point I was using the endo sequence system. I would create a glide path with a 15 and a 20 um, endo sequence just to get the glide path, our um, path from the coronal all the way down to the apical um, end of the tooth in a nice as straight line and access as you can. At that point I would start to crown down and on this case we went probably from a 40 and finished with a 35. We were able to finish this and then we would use our hydraulic condensation to fill the case and we were able to get a nice sealer puff at the end which I 
feel is a, is a, a sign of a well obturated case. So here we are in one of my operatories and I wanted to show you basically how I would treat a patient, triage and sterilization aspects of, of treating the patient. Before a patient comes in though, everything is as you would see it right here in a bag, in a sterilization bag. The patient comes in, they see everything as is, and we only open that bag, the sterilization pouch, when the patient comes in. And that way they know that everything that they're, that's going into their mouth has been pre-sterilized. The only exception we have is our hand files and ESX um, endosequence files. We pre-sterilize all of those files and then we place them in these sponges. The ESX are already pre-sterilized in, in the packet so we don't need to do that. But everything that goes in the patient's mouth is sterilized, even the, the clips here. As you can see, we use a rear delivery system. So pretty much as we're going, as we're working, um, we'll open up everything. We're, we're very minimalistic as far as what we use as an endodontic office. We know exactly what instruments we need and which instruments we do not need. So uh, we have a basic pack that would um, have our, um, we use two cotton pickups, we use a mirror, we use an endodontic explorer, have a curette. Um, and I have a periodontal probe, and a lot of times a periodontal probe is something that a lot of endodontists don't use, and I would you know, highly recommend that you do use that. As I'm instrumenting with uh, rotary instrumentation, I would go ahead and use one head. The patient, the uh, assistant would place the other, uh, the next uh, rotary instrument with a stop and measure it on our little measuring device here that's also sterilized, and then she would give me the next one and I would give that back to her. All of our rotary files are used one time. You cannot see, it's very insidious, you are not able to see when the uh, a rotary file is starting to separate and starting to and can possibly break. That's a little different than with the hand um, stainless steel files. I'm using K files, C files, C plus files. Um, those files we will use multiple times and the, um, I may use a 10 or a 6 or an 8 file one time when it starts to break or if I see any deformation in the file, we will actually uh, discard that file at that time. Um, our assistants, as they hand us those files, they're actually putting those files through light and you're able to see any reflection and any deformation that'll reflect and catch your eye. So that's a quick little process to see when um, a stainless steel um, hand file is starting to, um, to unravel and at that time we will discard them. We're very quick to discard files. I would rather um, discard a, a hand file uh, um, right away with it than um, risk any breakage. The same thing using our rotary files one time. There's no reason to use it again. You don't know how much torsion uh, or um, a torque you put on that file. Again, if you're in a, in a, um, in a uh, multi-group practice, you don't know if you're putting more stress and torque on it than the other practitioner, so it's a little different. So um, when we then move to obturation, the BC got aperture points, what we will do is we will, the assistant will place them, as you can see here in, in our um, bleach, for about 20 seconds, then hand that to me, and that will be our sterilization and then um, we will go ahead and heat it with our, we have an Endo Pro 270, um, bring that in um, when we are able to use that. So I hope you enjoyed your little tour and thank you for coming.